Check. There we go. Strange. I don't know why it changed. <laughs> Gotta learn your Ripley. <laughs> Alt F4. There we go. Is it working? Hey, look at this. Woohoo. Don't that's a that's an odd problem. I don't know what made the sound switch on it. Strange. Strange. This is a good way to get comments. I should just start them all on mute. It, it drives engagement. So everyone's like, you're on mute. And I'm not wearing my you're on mute shirt. I'm actually wearing my uh, Finn security search. <laughs> um, I'm going to give a shout out real quick here, though. And uh, throw a link in every. Here's just so a link for people too. I want to. Uh, I'm working on a video and I don't know exactly how I'm going to cover the video. Because I've done a video before. This is kind of just an update to something I've covered before. That's a commercial tool, but I will do a few disclosures here in a moment. Let me, all right, let me get the screen pulled up. So Finn Security. And uh, if you're not aware, Finn is a phishing tool. The phishing tool we use. No, this is not an advertisement. Yes, I'm an investor. So I want to make that very clear. I am choosing to talk about a company I invested money in because I think they're a great tool and we do use them at CNWR. So I'm kind of giving them a shout out here because they did something that I wanted them to do for a long time. And that is you can click a button and get a free trial. It's, it's a simple thing in my head. It's a complicated thing to the developers, the people involved, and the people who think you should talk to people before you sign up for things. I said, no, I hate signing up for things where I got to talk to people. I want to talk to no one to sign up for something. <laughs> and that is, uh, that was my push in investor meetings. So that is finished. It is finished. <laughs> I should, you know, P H I N. All right, you get it. Um, Nonetheless, this is the security awareness training tool that we use. I'm giving them a shout out. Uh, but as I said, uh, full disclosure, I have a bias towards them. So that's all I'm saying about it uh, is that they have the free trial option. I'm, I was thinking about maybe I'll do an updated video on Finn talking about it. But I've got a video you can find if you type in Finn uh, that breaks down me and the owner talking of how it works. It's something we use at CNWR. And as I said, it's something I'm an investor in. So yes, I have a bias to like it, but I think they make the best tool out there. That's why I put my money into it. And that's why we use them at CNWR. So uh, that's it. That's my um, shout out to Finn. So yeah, uh, you, this is, you're exactly right. I hate the contact form approach for a demo or price. Don't worry. You don't need to. You can click free trial. You do have to sign up for the trial, uh, but all the data is sent to you. You don't have to talk to a person to do anything. Uh, it, it, it's pretty simple. And uh, I'll leave it at that. It, it's a really simple process. They made it easy. So yes, absolutely. Oh, let's see. One of the things I like about Finn is I see people saying they like, and you can like the other ones you like. One of the things that Finn does better is the integration uh, for automation. That's where it's at. I, I, that's uh, it's very hands off and that matters a lot to me. So yes. Uh, am I caught up on Star Trek? Hmm. I mean, is there anything new out? I, I Has anything come out in 2024 yet? I, so if the answer is no to 2020, I haven't watched any Star Trek in 2024 because I believe all the series that I watch have ended in 2023. I mean, they have more coming. They just haven't released them yet. So, yeah. Uh, hi, Tom. Student runner at Michigan Tech. We're thinking about running Authentic to aid in an MFA with our AD. Have you used it? I have not used it, so I don't really have any thoughts on it. I've used Implement Grafana. Um, it, Grafana seems to be a favorite of the home lab people. I know I, I can't say it's not used in business. I know some business people that use it. I don't use it because I don't have a use case for it. But if you want pretty graphs, Grafana makes pretty graphs. So, yeah, definitely. Um, oh, Discovery dropped a new episode today. Okay, that I'm looking forward to. Westworld, thumbs up on Westworld. I like I like that series. Uh, that was good too. I finished the Fallout series, by the way. <laughs> Fallout. <laughs> Uh, would you ever consider making a video on how you mounted your Amcrest cameras to your home and ran Ethernet wiring? Uh, there's nothing secret about doing it. It's hard. <laughs> That's there's there's not like a uh, there's not a magic sauce to doing it. 
So it's like, yeah, you got to, I don't know. There's not, there's not much to do from a video standpoint. You mount them where you mount them. Um, it's hard running them in a house. I hate this. We don't even do residential. Uh, our wiring guys don't. So follows good. Um, finished follow. Yes, she cool. Yeah, it it Westworld does fall off after that first season. It does. Uh, you know, first season is so good. Second season maybe, but yeah, it kind of curves down. It's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. The first season is the best season of that for sure. All right, what were we going to talk about? Let's uh, what, where is the order at which I put things? True NAS. There is a lot of people that have questions about true NAS. I, I don't, I try not to get aggravated because I don't really get aggravated. It's not, I may come off sounding aggravated to some people, but there's people who just couldn't grasp I, a few comments of people really struggling to grasp the concept of how snapshots work. I did my best. I, the video is a little bit, I, I tried to put as much information because my years of doing true dance videos, I know the questions people ask and I try to cover them, but some people are still uh, doing it. Hopefully if, if anyone, I am very open to suggestions if someone has a better way to explain um, how things work. So <laughs> uh, you do residential came and make a pretty penny because businesses around here won't touch it. Yep. I'm among those people that just don't want to do it. Um, well, I, more the teams are around there. Uh, it's also residences. It, it's a tricky market. So yeah, hope fallout doesn't fall off. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll probably do an updated, um, SMB migration when I don't know what the SMB migration you're asking about is, uh, I might do an updated video on sync things. It's been a few years. There's enough new features to talk about, uh, more than anything else, but sync thing is definitely one of those, uh, tools I've been using forever. So that is definitely, um, it, it's one of my go-tos. I sync thing is. Let me pull one of these up here. Log into one of my true NASs. But yeah, sync thing is always something. I think there was an update to it. Yeah, it's up to date. Oh, oh I get more updates. So update all the things. Um, but yeah, sync thing. Love sync thing. I run it on my true NASs. Not all of them have sync things. Not everyone needs it because I have I have a lot of true NASs. Uh, but yeah, it's a solid tool for sure. Uh, I don't know if I have an answer. Run slower on Linux than Windows. I don't know if I have an answer for that. I've not noticed that much of a speed difference, but I'm not also, I'm not rebooting machines and seeing which way uh, I didn't do like a benchmark on windows and a benchmark on Linux to tell you which one's the fastest. So I'm not sure on the speed issue, but true net scale and file shares uh, be nice, be more advanced logging files touch than something I need. Uh, but the file protocols don't even seem to have it. Yes, they do. Matter of fact, we should switch over to here. Um, that's one of the new features in Dragonfish. So if we go here to our shares, is it right? Audit logs. There we go. So yes, they have uh, SMB audit logging. So that is a feature now in the new version of Junas. Well, it's in Release Canada right now. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start reviewing some of the firewalls. They finally have come around to being a better firewall and that means I'm going to review them. So yes. Uh, question on TrueNAS using cash eyes. Uh, is it worth it? I have an entire video about, is it worth it? It all depends on your workload. Most workloads probably won't benefit from it, but there are certain workloads that do. So there's not like a yes or no answer. Uh, it's extremely workload dependent. Like, do you need synchronized rights? 
and you need absolute uh, data integrity of those synchronized writes, and you probably need a slog drive on there. Yeah, it sync thing will work. That's one of the uh, tool things that Jay from Learn Likes TV. Uh, he he uses sync thing for his uh, um, syncing of his retro games. Oh, so this right here, I, I will actually talk about that. What you're probably referring to, and let's go over here to discover apps, is um, is it on this one? Which server is that going to be on? There's a way to have it do permissions. Uh, that's, ah, I don't know if it's a great idea, but it can be done. <laughs> So there's a way to have it do permissions. It's a matter of if you're doing this between two TrueNAS systems and syncing the file permissions between them. I, yeah, but I don't know that it's necessarily my use case I'd have for it. Um, my, I, I don't use it at all for that, and I wouldn't because uh, it just kind of becomes a pain. I have uh, recent videos on this to dive deeper in there, but essentially TrueNAS core runs FreeBSD, TrueNAS Scale, runs uh, Debian, and there's going to be a lot more development on there. Random questions. ZFS deduplication on encrypted files doesn't work. Ah, uh, I believe so, but usually deduplication other than niche uses is not a great idea because there's a huge performance hit. Now, they do have some updated code coming to ZFS that's going to fix the performance to make it better, but better is relative. There's a lot of overhead in running deduplication and is, are, I should say, are, are the files you're putting on there? Because it's all done at the block level, so are the files the same and because it only works within a data set even if the files are stored encrypted on that data set now if you send two encrypted files that are encrypted outside of TrueNAS, no it's not going to do anything at all so yeah that's the it, it is um it is tricky i know about the smb audit log the issue is that it does not give enough information regarding new files written to a share, but it does give the file size. IX system says SMB can't do it. Well, if the SMB can't do it, then it can't be done. I, I don't I don't have an easy solution for that. If, if it's not a feature of Samba, then it's probably not going to work. Uh, video topic. Hyper-V architecture, Microsoft's virtualization manager stack could look at how enabling role changes in Windows could help clear up misconceptions um my cons my view on hyper-v is that it sucks so i have no intentions of doing a video on it matter of fact you know microsoft reared its ugly head in exactly why hyper-v sucks twice this year first was the hyper-v problem that came in february with one of the updates that broke hyper-v second was the update that caused a memory leak in domain controllers, which also led to people's Hyper-V crashing, which are two reasons not to use Hyper-V. It's built on Windows. The other reason is it's built on Windows. <laughs> That's And Microsoft has decided all of you are beta testers because what are you going to do, not use Windows? That's kind of Microsoft's attitude right now. They don't care about testing. Well, they care about testing. They care that you do the testing, not them. <laughs> Thinking about using uh, three MSO1s as a Proxmox cluster? Um, go ahead. I mean, Proxmox has that built in. It's a pretty neat feature to have Ceph and all that built in to build a cluster. Go for it. Uh, all the new features come up pro coming out from Proxmox and SureNAS means more choices for network layout and storage. My SureNAS... Uh, boot disk, and I hadn't backed up the settings. Oh, my chance boot disk died, and I hadn't backed up the settings. Luckily, the data wasn't encrypted, but I still ran into trouble importing the pool, uh, even posting your forums, and they helped you there. Good. Glad glad they were able to get it back for you. Thankfully, I managed to get it working with Dragonfish, Now I'm wondering if there's a way to get it back to the stable version. Dragonfish is pretty stable, and it come, the stable version of Dragonfish comes out in uh, like seven days. So I would just do that. What email solution do you bill customers? Uh, we 
use Office 365 and Google for our, for our clients. Depends on the client. Probably the majority of the clients have Office 365, but there's still some with Google. Yep, we have uh, lots of companies that are moving away from VMware uh, as well. XCPNG, I mean, we've got companies that have moved like a thousand VMs, just like you. Uh, we just put a bid together for a company moving about 600 virtual machines over. So, yeah, it's a thing. Are jumbo frames relevant on Ceph? Um, probably not. I should do a video on that updated because once you go to 10 gig and plus networking, jumbo frames, there's a lot to it. They they did a good discussion on this in, uh, what was it? The uh, two and a half admins podcast, I think two episodes ago, they had a good discussion on this as a topic. And the problem is, in the olden days, and there's lots of advice still based on it because there's a forum post from 2008 that still says, absolutely, Jumbo Frames changes your life. It'll it'll bring joy to you and uh, amazing amounts of speed gains. Well, that's great if you're still running 2008 hardware. It brings less joy and more potential headache. doesn't mean there's not some tuning that can be done that helps with Jumbo Frames, but it's not going to be the night and day you think it is uh, when it comes there. The older systems, it was easier when you chunk things out into you know 9,000 MTU and you're like, great, I can stick all this data in there and I'm not processing as much uh, in the transactional data, but the smaller slicing up means there's a lot of small processing that the chips have to do that they were less capable of doing years ago, but more capable of doing now. So it becomes uh, kind of a lesser return. I use Proxmox extensively at my company and uh, you're pretty much Re, you rely on uh, community help to do it. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, XCPNG has a whole reseller program and a uh, partner program and a support SLA agreement. So it makes them a little bit different. Mm, let's see here. Um, I don't have any preference for Cisco devices. Use whatever Cisco device you want. Yeah, two and a half admins. Like I said, about two episodes ago, they talked about the jumbo frames. I inherited crap APC UPSs that seem to be original <laughs> install managing them. Yeah. Uh, Eaton, I've liked some of the Eaton stuff. It all depends. I mean, none of them are perfect. Yeah, updates to the new PF Sense. Let's swing to PF Sense. I think I've answered a handful of TrueNAS questions here. Um, feel free to pop more in. I have my TrueNAS pulled up. Actually, did it update? Let's log in and watch. See if the update's finished. Yay! Update's finished. So, cool. <laughs> uh, we purchased from NetGate. That's how we do our systems. And right now, I have this NetGate system here. I am running the release candidate on it. This is our lab system. Uh, but the... I love what they're doing here. And this is going to be, when they do this update, this is one of the features I really want to talk about is how they do this. The new update system uses a uh, watchdog timer. And essentially when it's doing the updates, oh, by the way, too, it's also got like configuration history in here. Uh, you can clone, um, you can clone the boot environments and set different ones, activate one time boot, but specifically the update mechanism. This is where the boot environments are really awesome for people who are specifically in the IT MSP space. And one of those big changes is the fact that when it 
does the update. It updates a new version of the boot environment, but leaves your old one intact. Then when it reboots, if that boot environment doesn't come up within X number of seconds, it reboots back to the previous boot environment. So if you're doing remote updates, all you have to do is wait a few minutes and the system will come back online if the update fails. And that is awesome. That is a uh, feature that I'm like, is going to make remote updates so much easier for people in the IT MSP space that use them like us. Um, so when you have remote firewalls, that's, you know, that's always the scary part is updating. It's not managing them remotely. It's, oh boy, there's an update. So the new boot environment stuff is really cool. Um, DHCP server. I'm still using the ISC one. I know you can switch it, but I don't think it's feature complete yet. Um, let's go over though, some of the new things that are in here, uh, default password control. This is an expected, um, change, just, uh, policies and rules around passwords in terms of like what you can have as a default. So that, uh, this right here is what I was talking about the enhanced process using ZFS snapshots for the updates. Yes, that's cool. Uh, packet data flow export. This is interesting. Uh, there, I'm going to have to play around with this and see how that works. So let's see. If we click on learn more, is it in the documentation? Yeah. So it's basically using uh, NetFlow, 5, NetFlow 5 to send the data out so you can send the data to where you want it. So that's pretty cool. Another change, enhanced gateway recovery process with this optional reset connections made through backup gateway when the primary gateway is offline. This feature allows connection to fail back to a primary gateway after downtime. Uh, can be this can be especially useful for metered links. That's cool. I this is a this is going to be an interesting feature because a lot of times people have like a cell network as a backup, so being able to push it back. Uh, mobile group pools. That sounds interesting. Oh, uh, this update optimization for CPU supporting AVX 512 and AVX 2. Uh, so smoother operation. So it's good. Um, IV set kernel modules. Very cool there. And what is the other smaller issues that are in here? Those are some big changes, though. I mean, look wise, it's pretty much the same. Are you, any for, uh, are you aware of any support for NSV4 style ACLs and TrueNAS being added? The ACML is probably my number one reason for staying in TrueNAS core for now. Uh, nope, I don't know. That's a question asked in the TrueNAS forums on there because I don't think there's an option for that. I could be wrong. Do I, do I have an NFS share set up? I think so. Yeah, I don't think it has. I, I'm not sure. So that's a question for them. Looking to replace my switch with a low power, low noise, one gig switch, VLANs. Uh, I don't. I mean, I like the Unify stuff. Mikrotik is usually pretty cheap, uh, but I don't really know what all the features you're looking for is. Uh, the boot environment thing is not a feature of the community edition. Yeah, I, so OpenSense uh, has finally caught up with some of the security features that PFSense has had for a while, so yeah. I assume it does uh, base itself on the watchdog timers. Uh, nothing's immutable in tech. I don't like that term without context around it. Uh, best way to get started PF sense on the cheap. Uh, Nikki. 1100 versus buying Chinese cheap box. 
uh, building your own kind of afraid of her be a little anemic. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Uh, finding some really cheap box like this, like this Kotom one, you know, <laughs> there we go. I mean, these are cheap. I, it, it's going to uh, cheaper than this is a used system. So yes. Um, how do you handle firmware? Up, how do you handle firmware updates to hardware's automation under XCPG possible? Nutanix migrates VMs, checks if successful before doing other hosts in the cluster. Uh, is automation? Yes, automation is fully possible. You could do automated migrations uh, and rolling pool updates. Uh, I got an old Sophos U UTM two twenty. It's dual core, two gigs. Is it worth uh, PF Sense? Is it worth loading PF Sense on it instead of virtualizing it? I mean. Those will probably work. Boot environments are nice. I'll agree with that. Why are they optimizing for x64 v4 platforms? I don't know. That's a them question. How do you typically secure NFS? Uh, do you just use a storage only network and secure it via firewall rules and access that VLAN? Uh, you put storage on a dedicated network for NFS and you can do IP filtering. So inside of your TrueNAS config, you can go to the shares for NFS. Go down here to the advanced options. And this is my lab. So there's no uh, security settings on here, but that's generally how you do it. I, I don't think OpenSense has ZFS boot environments. Let me look, maybe I'm wrong. Is it natively built in is what I'm trying to figure out. So looking into forums here. You know, that's the one thing. OpenSense sucks at still. Documentation. <laughs> So people talk about it, but there's not much documentation on it. That is certainly a feature missing from the OpenSense. Like if you type in PFSense boot environments, you land direct. The first re the first result is their documentation page on it. Um, the third or fourth result still isn't the documentation page for OpenSense. Do they have a documentation? Uh, do they have a documentation page on it? I guess I should ask. Yeah, only optical and NAND ROM are truly, yeah. Yeah, I was actually started looking at this as well, the updated uh, firewall video for 2024 here. Um, the Quotam Chinese mini PCs are great for PFSense. Uh, they are not perfect. So there's a reason that this one's labeled like it is. Please note that it's labeled IGB 0, 1, and 2. Now, one would think that this one right here would be IGB zero. And you would be right that it used to be IGB zero. Um, then it died. The, this network port just quit. It was working and then it decided it's not working. And then all the networks got goofed up because they all shifted over one. So yes, this is now IGB zero for some reason. And this one is non-existent. It does not show up in a hardware list. Random. Because it works otherwise. That's why it's sitting here. It's kind of a weird problem. So, yes. <laughs> When's that Wi-Fi video coming? Coming soon.
Okay, so you it does it from the command line on OpenSense. I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. Mm, I mean, they post on April 1st, like many other companies did about things. So I don't know that that's actually happening. Uh, what's your strategy for backups? Yeah, S3 and MinIO works good. Um, I I have three locations, so I don't actually have to back up to the cloud. I can switch things between my three locations, and we have a colo, which I've I have. Well, the company has data on the colo. I don't personally. I am definitely excited for MSP GeekCon. Uh, did you ever apply a WAF or some module inside of Nginx or PFSense? Uh, there's not exactly, there's not a web application firewall, but there is HA proxy inside of PFSense. Yep, I did cover some of the PFSense updates. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time with OpenSense and Zen Arbor in there. Eh, ebb and flow of companies. They lay people off. I, I People make a bigger deal about it than it is. You got you to gotta measure what percentage that is. And investors want to see movement sometimes, like whoever's holding the money going, we should get rid of 3%, 1%, whatever that number is. And uh yeah, welcome to the wor corporate world where you're a number until you're, you, the number's got to go this way a little bit. So some of the people go away with it. <laughs> uh, Infoban for Home Lab. I think 10G is fine, but yeah. Do you find the lack of PFSense uh, features compared to other appliances? You know, the feature I really think PFSense is lacking is. I mean, Fortinet has so many flaws and so many zero days in it. I feel that's a lacking feature uh, in an enterprise firewall. And Palo Alto joined them in, in, in their crusade for this. Let me point this out. This is the feature that people ask about that I hate. And it, we're to the point where, and let me, uh, no, that's not working. There we go. Share this tab instead. SSL vulnerability, all these companies that have them, Fortinet, Avanti, Cisco, Palo Alto now is added to this list, and they're back. This is just an indefensible, you know, I, I shared this on Twitter and LinkedIn and some other places. I feel that these old SSL VPNs are not a feature, they're a bug or bug ridden. So I don't know. I I don't feel that lacking with the PF sense compared to the other ones. The reality is you watch all these different threats that hit these companies and you're like, but Tom won't insert name of some magical threat that goes, you know, inside the firewall. Won't that save us? No, it won't. Matter of fact, it, those are always latent uh, tools. Like they, they rely on enough information being out there to hopefully see some IP addresses and block them. And it just doesn't seem to hold up very well. By the way, you can use PF Blocker and throw a threat feed in there along with um, a paid subscription to the ET Open uh, or what is the other uh, emerging ET, ET rules for Siracata or the Snort subscription rules. And, you know, uh, they're as good as any other firewall at that point. Um, I don't do filtering on a firewall. I think it's a terrible idea. Uh, we use OIT VoIP. Um, I don't, the problem is PF, the problem with PF blocker is it, it doesn't have fine grain control. Uh, so we use it for certain features like sinkholing countries that you're not in. Those are good. If you have, if you have ports open, if you're not even opening ports, why bother setting it up? Uh, I have no idea if you can install QEMU, QEMU in PF sense. Never tried. Uh, been on my to-do list. They've asked me to do a video on it a couple times. It's just low on my priority list. It, it's not that interesting to me. I think they do an amazing product for protecting a website. I 
more and more we're opening less and less ports besides VPN. So modifying it is not something I would ever do in production because I only liked production supported things on PFSense. I don't like random uh, things. Not that I think that there's some random company. I just don't have a lot of client use case for it. It's not like we have that many PF senses that are out there sitting in front of web servers. Just not a common, it's a common home lab use case. It's an uncommon use case for any of our business clients. Well, if you're running HA proxy and you have a need to filter it, you have to run it on WAN. There's not really another option. So it's not, I don't recommend it on WAN. And the problem is if you have HA proxy, the only way to do it's on WAN, which means you're just going to get a bunch of noise. Um, you're going to block a lot of things. Um. It, it's whatever you put in the feed list, but I don't even use it for that because I use uBlock in the browser because it works better. What is TailScale in detail? TailScale is an overlay VPN network. Um, it was one of the ones that Zero Tier was probably the first one I spent time reviewing. Uh, the second one being TailScale. The two of them are really good, but TailScale has done a great job, shockingly, as a private company. We, we kind of joked, like, how have they not become evil yet? Um, they they keep growing. And matter of fact, when they said when they announced they were doing changes, you're like, ah, here, here comes TailScale. They're going to change the, the fees that they charge users. They actually gave people more things for free. <laughs> So uh, Tailscale has actually been an interesting project. I, I also like NetBird, uh, but Tailscale having, as they may refer to it in the business world, first movers advantage of building out a large scale uh, overlay VPN system. They have a lot of product uh, that they're integrated in. I, I kind of want to do a video on NetBird. I've just been busy. Um, NetBird's a pretty cool one, but I did a video where I break down several overlay overlay VPNs. If you type in, in my channel, overlay VPN, you'll find my reviews of them. Uh, do I think that they'll migrate PF Sense? I don't know. It comes down to, it takes a monumental amount of effort in terms of like what you have to pay the coders. It's a cost benefit thing. If they move away from BSD and they move it over to Linux, cool. We all like Linux over here and we realize the BSD ecosystem is kind of shrinking. Uh, the question is, will NetGate spend the money on the developers doing it? Uh, by the way, interesting side effect of this, the uh, PFSense and OpenSense arguments go away because NetGate currently is about 15 or 16 percent of the contributes that go into BSD. If they stop contributing to BSD because PFSense uh, is an upstream pusher of those commits and OpenSense is a downstream receiver of those, uh, you'll actually see OpenSense probably fall off uh, greatly if PFSense were to move. But I, will they move? I don't know. Um, it comes down to they have to do a cost benefit. They have to decide, do we spend the money to do it? Uh, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't really have an interest in Zen armor. The other problem is things like Zen armor are going to keep getting less and less effective because more and more sites are using more and more encryption. Matter of fact, the, you know, uh, is it called, I can't remember, is it encrypted hello or is that the one that got replaced? The latest one they're working towards, but the more, it, as they encrypt the SNI, essentially, whatever mechanism ends up winning to do that, that is what destroys any of these tools like Zen Armor. Their, effect, their effectiveness goes down even further. Uh, it's uh, Right now, Zen Armor and any of the tools that do web filtering are able to do so because they're able to look at the SNI headers. But as that gets encrypted, I'm just looking at the long term. It'll work for now, but as the web changes and as more things get encrypted, they break. Uh, my default browser is 
uh, Chrome for work and Firefox for personal, but I don't do much personal web surfing. Uh, awesome open source and so does Christian Lempa. Both of them have uh, videos on NetBird. What do you think about Define Networking? They use Nebula. It's a great service. I think theirs is pretty cool. Uh, do you have a cert you recommend? You know, watch my other video on certs. Um, me and Jay talked about it, but I'm not, I don't have any certs, so I can't really, uh, say that. Uh, when you say open ports, does that include VPN inbound ports? Uh, is that where you use PF blocker? Yeah, but I don't worry as much about VPN inbound ports because they require certificates. If you're using WireGuard or OpenVPN, OpenVPN being the more popular one we use for users, because it requires a certificate to start talking, I don't, it's not my worry, so to speak. Uh, OpenVPN is a well vetted protocol. There hasn't been a flaw that's been, that's gotten people past the need for a cert in a long time. And uh, that's one of the reasons I like OpenVPN. I mean, it, hey, if you're using PF Blocker to geo block, so there's less people banging on that particular port, cool. You can reduce it. Uh, but it's not like my, it's not what keeps me up at night. I think the benefits and probably the main benefit for home labbers is the main category for filtering. Yeah, it, right now it works and because not everything's encrypted, but as it gets encrypted, yeah. Uh, TLS encrypted client hello, ECL. That's what it was called. I remember it was ECL. I can't remember um, how, what it was, what the ECL stood for, but yes. Is it impossible? Uh, it's not exactly. There's a, they have a write up on kind of a way to do it, but no, not really. One IP doesn't work very well. Uh, my answer for Squid is don't use Squid. Squid is a security nightmare. The uh, basically last year, and I shared this out, and it caused some controversy. But basically, even Netgate's like, yeah, don't use Squid because the. A security researcher poked a squid and found a bunch of flaws. The team at Squid replied, yep, those flaws exist. If someone wants to fix them, go ahead. Uh, this is one of those challenges right now in the open source world of everyone wants their free tool, but if there's not enough people to maintain it, the free tool kind of falls apart. And Squid is in that life cycle where they have too few people. It's used all over the place, but too few people contributing to it. So it's become kind of a mess. And yeah, that's uh, I would avoid Squid. Uh, nope, I don't use Nextcloud in production. I just don't have a need for it. Um, what would you recommend to stop or minimize man in the middle attacks? Uh, certificates, <laughs> encryption. Um, I guess it depends what type of man in the middle attack you're trying to mitigate. Oh, you got a trial for Coursera and you're able to get three certs before time lapse. Cool. Yeah, they had a they had a switch that never made it out of EA. Um they I think they have some new ones coming, but they did have their leaf switch, is what they called it, which was supposed to have a lot of them. Their aggr aggregation switches, aggravation switches was named in my system. Uh, those do support SFP 28, but there's only four ports on those ones. Uh, it's a hundred. Oh, a uh, homeland license for TNS, TNSR. I don't know. I haven't used TN, uh, Tinsir as they pronounce it. Are you guys doing any access control or you're waiting to get into it? Nah, not our niche. We, we're not a big access control company. We've, I mean, we installed a bunch of the unified controllers and stuff like that, but access control is not our, uh, not our niche. We don't do that much cabling and wiring either. So we do some, but not, it's not, it's not our primary business. Uh, what rules do you apply for the homeland? I have a video for 
PF Sense Small Business. I should probably read. I should probably make a new one just called PF Sense for the Home. Uh, but you know, I have an IoT network. Uh, in I call that uh, NSFW, not Safe for Work Network, and I have a work network uh, where work things can happen. So any my Chromecast and random people's phones and friends that come over all go on the uh, IoT network, and then the other network is my network that's not that network. Oh, and I have one. I have one more network that's for uh, just my cameras. Uh, do you know how well Telsco works IPv6? Nope, I turn IPv6 off. I don't know. English is hard. Is 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 it a niche or a niche? I think it's a niche. Uh, kind of like the Unify USW Ultra Switch being pricey. Uh, yeah, what you know? Let's U I dot com switching. They have their Pro Max switches. which have lots of lights and which ones have the, yeah, you got to go to their, these ones. These are the ones that do have, um, four, 10 gig. Where's the ones? There we go. Yeah. Aggregation. So they have a few that have the SFP 28s. Yep, four, four SFP 28s on that model. Tomato, tomato, yes. I have VLANs for IoT servers, guests, and home users. Well, I'm okay with the first three. I'm not sure what to apply for the home VLAN. IoT servers, guests, and home users. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily understand the question. You run a pretty big MSP. Do you find the lack of single pane of glass for administering your PF Sense deployment a problem? I got three. I'm uh, looking out for. I'm, what are you doing in it every day? The, the updates come out every like there's three updates a year. What are, what are you going into PF senses every day for? I guess that's my maybe that's the part I'm missing. I prefer never to run a captive portal. Captive portals are just a headache. I avoid them at all costs. <laughs> Are uh, using a web-based photo management system? Um, I don't have the patience for them either. I, I mean, I use Synology, so I have a private backup of my photos. Synology's, I, I know it's not open source. I wish it was, but Synology's at least stable. Um, I I just haven't seen any good open source photo management. And if you ask my friend Jay from Learn Linux TV, his answer is really simple. He's like, I just organize everything into folders. Like, you know, when he goes on vacation or takes some photos that he cares about, he takes them off his phone and he puts them in the folder he wants and he just has structured folders. That's it. There's no management software that he's using for it. How far does CNWR offer regular on-site support? Um, I would say probably within 60 plus, I don't know maybe 30 miles of our Detroit office and 30 or 40 miles of our Toledo office. I, I, I'd have to draw it around. Um, I think all in maybe Travis will chime in, but yeah, there, there's not exactly, it's not, I don't think we have an exact number, but I think all the clients that we regularly offer, we have some clients though that have remote offices that we service from time to time that I know are further, but mostly it's, let's just throw a number out there. 
of what we're targeting for is within probably 30 or 40 miles of either of our Detroit office or our Toledo office. Uh, can you do a video or vlog Thursday on VGPU pass-through and NVIDIA? I don't have one of those and I'm not likely to do it. Um, I'll dig into to see what they're doing. They do have that feature they added. So if you go here, and I'm assuming what they have under router advertisements... I imagine this is for uh, you know what I bet this is they they're just integrating FRR. So they have a page on it. Not exactly. Oh, is this all IPv6? Oh, this is all IPv6 stuff. Okay. So that's all for IPv6. Yep. Yeah, I see it like Travis says here. Uh Travis Travis is project manager at CNWR. So anything Anything higher than two-hour drive is going to incur heavy travel expenses uh, to the client. 99% of our supports can done remotely. That's true, too. 99, I would say probably 99.9% .9 of our support is done remotely. We have a lot of out-of-state clients, too. So, I, I don't think outside of learning, most people have a real use case for Layer 3 routing options inside their switch. For learning, yes. For most home users, I don't know that they... I mean, it's not that you can't come up with your own use case for it, but they usually don't have environments that uh, really need that. Uh, what is something that everyone should be using? Soap. Everyone should use soap. Like to bathe. Uh, I am assuming you're using SureNAS replication uh, to your other sites. Are you doing snapshot method or diff? Uh, snapshots. I send snapshots to the other sites. With snapshots, I get confused. It's the way time shift works where, uh, where people say it takes a snapshot of your drive. So I thought SureNAS was the same. Uh, I've not used time. I, I think there is. I, I think you're referring to the Linux backup utility called time shift, and I haven't used it. If you had to choose one zero trust platform or service, what would you pick? I have no idea there. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer for that one. Soap. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the old uh, soap calls, the soap APIs are terrible to work with. Yes. <laughs> Sponsored by soap. Yeah, and just like I said, if you're if you're wanting to learn how to do it, I think having a layer three uh, in your home lab is great. So what do you you know running VLANs on your uh, our Cisco and building routes in between and everything else? Great learning opportunities. So there's definitely opportunities there to learn all that stuff. But yeah, but route advertisement through IPv6, fun stuff that that's built in now. Do I have a tail scale set up in here? Yeah, looks like it. Tail scales in here. Everything else looks pretty much the same. Actually, what I should look at is did they add any more packages to this? Ooh, what's this? Peanut butter. I love peanut butter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, iperf available package is not what I installed. Mm. 
Bandwidth, Bind, Cron. I don't see anything new in here. You know, it's funny. They still have some of the squid stuff in here. And top NG. No, oh, they still have squid in here. They tell people not to use it, but it's still in here. I said to break everything if they, there's so many people using it. So, you know, I didn't look. Where do they have status? Is it under system logs? I haven't played with the um, IP flow stuff at all. Where do they put that? It's in here. Learn more. Where is the option for the IP fix flow? Well, that didn't take me where I wanted to go. <laughs> I'm probably looking. Uh, where is that at? Well, somewhere in there. I'll find that later. <laughs> it's under firewall. There we go. The 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 brain trust the people in here. They're they're realizing that. Uh, Packet flow data right there. She looked at the most obvious. Save. Apply. And we can add description, source, destination. Neat. You know, I'm pretty sure you can... Um, Let's look this up. Uh, let me close. I got too many tabs open. But I think you can do this in gray log. Yep. It looks like you can. Graylog supports NetFlow. So we, this is actually, uh, this will be a fun video. So, here, you know, when I get the new version set up, I'll uh, build a Graylog NetFlow importer. Uh, can you delete DHCP pieces, DHCP leases manually so an IP goes free in another device, uh, static IP? Uh, you, I always set reservations for everything, um, so I don't have to worry about that. That's my recommended way for doing it. Reserve everything that you care about having it land where you want it to land, but DHCPs get uh, uh, in the address pool, they get recycled over time, anyways. Do you know where you can, I can get a cheap static IP because my ISP is a dynamic one? Yeah, uh, hosting companies. That's probably going to be your best bet for that is uh, go to the hosting companies and they'll have, they have options for that. Digital Ocean, Vulture Incident, probably uh, static IPs. You can use WireGuard uh, back or something. Depends on bandwidth. Yep. Yeah, I might do an updated video on that because uh, I believe there's a really easy way to do this with TailScale where you can set TailScale up on your public IP, then tie your PFSense to it and build it as an exit node. Like it's a... There's plenty of ways to do this, but this way requires some of the fewest number of steps. That's what a lot of home users are looking for is how can I do this in the minimal amount of steps in the easiest tutorial? Uh, can, can the tutorial be like this many minutes, fewer and fewer minutes, so I can get to the goal of having this as my public IP address? <laughs> Yeah, and this is a great idea uh, right here. I always leave plenty of room at the top and bottom of my DHCP range for anything I like to set as static. I actually move all, move everything to the end. I like all the DHCP stuff to be the high numbers, and then it's 
less digits to type and the the bottom half is reserved depending on the network for my statically set addresses um i think we only have like one or two companies left using it I, they've all just kind of not renewed and disappeared um in terms of their demand for it, uh, we moved some of them to PF Sense. I think I can't remember what other people got. I think PF Sense most of the time. Oh, by the way, uh, Open Sense twenty four six twenty four one dot six was released today. If you're using Zen Armor. Uh, not recommended upgrade yet. It'll break it. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I love that Alex is doing uh, the tutorials. It's cool. Alex, I think he saw for Red Hat when I first met him. Uh, he was actually on a few, the first few episodes uh, in early, well, first within the first 10 episodes we did of the Home Lab show. Uh, he's a mutual friend of me and Jay's, but a Alex is great. Yeah, it's really cool to see him over there at uh, Tailscale. Yeah, this is this is something to always consider. You have bandwidth limitations. So if you decide to do something such as, you know, moving over to a uh, one of the cloud companies for that, you will have to pay the fees that get attached to that. And that may not be reasonable to you. I have 150 plus IoT device at home and not every access point can support. So now I have uh, three of them share amongst them. Is there a better way to do it rather than uh, multiple? Nope, multiple is the answer. You know, when you're doing Wi-Fi planning and things like that, there, there comes capacity limitations of what you can do with a single AP. You can get higher density APs to support more devices, but yeah. Is there a reason why the Home Lab show show starts from episode 27 on any other platform on YouTube? Yeah, that is some weird bug of when you have too many that no one's been able to really tell me why, but it's some publishing problem with WordPress. I don't know. Um, the solution really is for us to move it to some other platform. I just don't like Spotify or all those other services that much. I'm trying to get it easy for people to download. Um, I don't know. It, it's not something I put enough time into to solve, I, I guess. Yeah, I, I actually host um, my forums right now and my uh, Lawrence Systems website. Both of those are on Linode. Um, so if you, I, I'm happy with the amount of bandwidth I have for that. Um, let's encrypt, let's encrypt is what I use for everything. I, I, I never understood these companies. I think they're just fleecing you for some money when they try to sell you these SSL certs. Like seriously, use let's encrypt. It works amazingly well. Uh, it's, you know, managed by the, uh, Linux foundation. I can't find a reason not to use it. Can you use it as a TFTP server? I don't know. I've never tried if there's some way to make that work. Yeah. Not something I've tried much of. For your home lab, you don't want to create... I create my one certificate, not dependent. I mean, you can build your own. I mean, there's, you can Google this. It's not something I'm going to do a video on. Uh, but yes, people can build their own certificate authorities and tie it all together and then install those certificates or trust them within all of your devices. That is something that can be done. It's charging for OV and EV makes sense. Not on websites anymore. No one knows when they go to a website, 
outside of maybe people in this audience, uh, pretty much no one bothers to look if they're, oh, before I before I put my credit card in, did they did they get an EV search or an OV search? I need to know before I put my credit card in. Now, software signing is separate, but I'm specifically talking about website certif certificates. Um, no one, I think, at all checks at all. So <laughs> no one's like, oh, no, ah, dropping stuff. <clears throat> there are some situations where you can't use let's encrypt such as I, I, well, I mean, if you're trying to sign software, yeah, that's not what it would be for, but I'm not sure what web application you have that wouldn't use it from a web application standpoint. I don't see any problem with let's encrypt, but that's from a web application standpoint. You know, if you have use cases outside of that, well, then that's a whole different topic. Yeah, and this is exactly it. Uh, it's been, I think, a few years now since the browser stopped displaying the EV info. They used to have, do you remember when Chrome had the little secure thing up there and Firefox did something similar? Yeah. Uh, soon. No, I wouldn't say soon is an option for when that'll happen. ZFS expansion will come, but yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say soon on that. I think there's a, there is a future by which this will exist. That future is not today. PF, PF sense plus HA proxy plus let's encrypt is a glorious thing. And I a hundred percent agree with you. SSL search for banking. Um, I, I'm going to go once again, outside of the people inside of this live stream, the average consumer does not go, hold on. Let me make sure my bank has an extended, you know, EV cert uh, before they actually log in. I, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't think that happens off. Well, NAC captive portal is a little bit different, but I'm actually, um, I would say captive portal. I don't see many reasons why it wouldn't work with let's encrypt. I don't know about network access control systems. That might be a little different, but I mean, let's encrypt is a pretty widely accepted, uh, certificate authority. So. Yeah, I'm sure the banks have that anyway. So I, I, I'm not saying, I'm not telling the banks not to use it. I'm just telling, I'm just saying that I'm willing to bet, um, there's a lot of banks not using it. I'm wondering about no one checks if they are or aren't. <laughs> Is hosting your own mail server viable today? Any use case that makes sense for home lab email? Uh, it's a fun learning opportunity. I used to run my own mail servers for years and years and years, but I finally, I think I shut them down in 2016 or 17. That was the last time I ran them. I'll have to look, you know, I, do I still have a backup on my mail server on I see if this still exists. I'm curious. Nope. I moved it off of, I, I archived it. I thought I maybe still had a copy, but I had the copy running. Um, maybe it was 2017 or 2018 when I got rid of it, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. It, it, it's one is a security risk if you're not keeping up with it, uh, but it's a good learning opportunity to understand how mail works. Make a video, uh, trying to restore back up with modern XCPNG. I've got uh, videos on that topic. This is the real challenge for sure. Uh, personal mail servers are, you cannot send from a Comcast wide open West. Most of your consumer IP blocks are blocked. Uh, matter of fact, there was a rant. I, I've been a long time listener to the two and a half admins podcast for a while. Microsoft blocked Linode. So if you chose to, put Linode as your mail server, Microsoft for, I think almost three or four months, just blocked Linode, the entirety of Linode. You couldn't run a mail server on and send an email to someone who was using Microsoft. So yeah, they're just such a headache to, you know, everyone's trying to solve the spam problem. No one's solving the spam problem. Um, they rely on blocking IP addresses 
but then the spam is coming from people who are using at outlook.com at live.com at yahoo.com at gmail.com. That's all. Those are the, the um, places where I get spam from. <laughs> They're, they're not solving the spam problem. Well, those almost universally on my uh, Google G Suite account end up in the spam bucket, but that's where they're always coming from. <laughs> yeah, and Gmail blocking Microsoft the other week. And then Microsoft announced that they're going to uh, limit how much email can be sent uh, because they, they realized they were a spam problem. So it's, it's a, even though we've consolidated it to just a couple providers, we didn't solve the spam problem at all. <laughs> uh, it's now, this is nice thing is it is becoming more globally enforced, but back to the point of the spam's not coming from random domain that hasn't gone through validation. It's these stupid emails I get that are, Tom, would you like to buy a list of people from at outlook.com all the time? So, or at gmail.com. Uh, yes, I still use uh, Mailgun for my Discord server. Oh, so they were blocking uh, Hensner as well. SMTP to go. Yep, that's that's the thing. You have to find a relay service to accept the out to take your email and then relay it back out. Yeah, the the mail server thing is not something I'd recommend. You know, this question comes up a lot is, uh, do you set up, you know, WP Enterprise or Free Radius for your home network or is that total overkill? I think you're going to aggravate your, your if you're in the network by yourself, you're fine. If you have to share the network with friends who you want, friends or family who also want a network, um, it's more of a headache. And here's the reality of it. And this is where people get caught up on the wrong thing. They'll spend a lot of time and it's a great learning opportunity. So if, if the goal is learning, awesome, run with it. Um, if I let you on my network, what would you do? You know, that's kind of the bigger problem of being on my network doesn't really get you anywhere. Now, first, because I shared that screen earlier, and this is true, I do have a lab NFS share that I set up for temporary demos for doing YouTube videos. Yes, if you were on my network, you somehow got onto my Wi-Fi, you've breached the perimeter, now you're on inside of the network, and I'm in, like they say in all the hacker movies, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Well, the first thing you're going to find is an FS share. Then that's also the last thing you're going to find, which, by the way, that's on a demo system that'll be shut down at some point. So as I'm talking about as of today, when you got into a production network that we have at work, for example, you also would find yourself not getting very far. We have very restrictive lists inside of the network for people who are on the list, we filter by IP. And the only thing that filter's doing is just one more layer to get you to another login screen that has 2FA. So the fact that the systems we run internally also have 2FA and there's no assumption that because you're inside the perimeter that you have any more permissive access than a random stranger, that is kind of a better mindset. And as long as you're locking down every step of the way, much better. So someone getting on my Wi-Fi doesn't, doesn't exactly scare me. It's not my, it's not what keeps me up at night because you'd have to then figure out how to get into, I mean, even my internal synologies, I've went through the trouble of setting 2FA up on, even though they're not exposed to the internet, they're not exposed to the outside world. So you would find my synology and you go, well, I, I need his username, his password, and then I need his phone to get the rolling digits. <laughs> That's I, I've got the bar set that high. And as long as you're always thinking that, you know, the term I've heard used a lot is kind of work under the assume breach model where you lock everything down just because someone's inside your network doesn't give them any more permissive access. So, yes, it's overkill. Um, but, hey, do it if it's a learning opportunity. Let's see. 
Uh, True Dance Core, upgrade True Dance Scale. Looks slicker. Uh, is it viable? I think True Dance Scale is actually really reliable. I'm, I'm, I have no problems with it at all. This is, I've been using it in several production systems. Oh, let's see. Oh, uh, what about the honeypot feature? I mean, it's novel. If you want notices, if someone's in the honeypot, honeypots are a fun thing to have on your network because then you know if someone's on your network. Uh, the way I know is I, I've done a video on this. I like ARP Watch. If something new shows up on my network, I get a notice. That's my notice. Like, hey, something new is on the network. Well, why would there be something new on the network? Nothing new should be on my network. Uh, I love ARP Watch. That is great. But uh, honeypots are good, too, because the same answer. Why did someone try to log into this thing that no one should log into? Honeypots are a great way to trigger that. Um, there's no official 2FA and PF sense as far as the login. I, I don't worry about that much. Um, it's... It's one of those things, too, that 2FA is nice. Don't get me wrong. But my PFSense passwords are, it's not exposed to the internet, and they're really high entropy. So someone would have to uh, have acquired that. That's not something easy to acquire is that PFSense password. Granted, yeah, you could do that. But you could technically, and if you're trying to pass a compliance audit, uh, IP restrict the web interface on PFSense to a certain IP address, and that is a second factor of authentication, even though it's a static one. Uh, LinStore and LinBit specifically does have some videos comparing them to Ceph. Um, I don't, they're different solutions. They're both good solutions, but they're different. So I recommend if you, it, it's a blog post they have that's from late last year or earlier this year about comparing LinBit and Ceph. Have I tried the update protection? I haven't tested it, um, but I know it has it for the PFSense 2403. Um, I believe ARPWatch. Uh, I know it's in PFSense. Looks like there's a Linux version as well. I'm using ARPWatch inside of PFSense. I switched my NAS from true NAS scale to uh, from true NAS scale to true NAS scale is really low. What gives? Uh, it only, I've got a video on caching, which will be irrelevant in version 24, but the Linux version of scale only by default uses 50% and up to version 23. Once you go to version 24, it uh, will take advantage of all the cache inside of true NAS. No, we're certainly not doing 404 today. I'm I'm going to run out of steam soon. I'm going to go a few more minutes because I need to go get some exercise, and it's beautiful outside. Um, no, it's not an end of life. This is a little. This is where there's a lot of confusion. Maybe I'll bring Chris Moore on so he can uh, Chris Moore on the channel so he can uh, talk about this. Chris Moore is head of development over there at IX Systems for the True Nash project, and it's not an end of life. But they are saying we're not cramming new features into it. We're going to bring it up to uh, version 13.3 and we're going to keep it stable and patched. We're just not adding a lot of features. So USGs finally went end of life. There we go. They, they, they were on life support. Those are old. Uh, permissions should carry over from TrueNAS uh, to TrueNAS because the permissions are all set within the ZFS system. I've not really had a permissions problem when I go from version to version. That's not where my troubles um, are, if there's troubles. What kind of, I love virtualization technology. I don't, that's my kind of go to answer when people ask what I think about the future of tech. But that's where I'm going to leave us. I will be back again soon. I have some fun stuff to go do right now. Um, as I realized it's almost 4.30 and 4.30 was the time I wanted to cut things off. Yeah, that's virtualization is just magical, isn't it? 
Uh, TrueNAS Core is already feature complete. Doesn't need new features. Uh, TrueNAS Scale is turning into a lot of features. Yes, you're correct. So, um, yeah, there. I, there's not. I, I still have um, eh, a couple core systems. We have clients using it. I'm not. We're not switching them anytime soon. It's one of those ain't broke, don't fix it. We're keeping it patched, keeping it up to date. IX Systems is still putting updates out for TrueNAS Core, so it doesn't have to be replaced today. Um, so yeah, but that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you. And by the way, I forgot to throw this up earlier, but I always mention to people, um, I still reply to people who send emails to vlog Thursday at Lawrence systems.com. I've realized vlog Thursday at Lawrence systems.com is hard to spell. I have a catch all address that goes to the spam box. And sometimes I go through there and look for varied ways people spell vlog Thursday. <laughs> it's, it's been some amusement to me. Um, anyways, <laughs> And I don't always go in that box. A lot of those just go to nowhere. Um, I have a WAN failover video and I have a SD WAN video that explain it. Actually, my SD WAN might help you understand better how that works. The short answer is no, you can't just aggregate um, speed together. Probably not the way you're thinking. There's a way to make it work, but not necessarily the way you think it works. But thanks you everyone from joining. Email me, ping me, forums.lawrencesystems.com, LinkedIn. Check out Finn, like I said earlier, in their new sign-up thing. If you're looking for a uh, cybersecurity phishing thing, that's whose shirt I'm wearing today, if anyone cares. And uh, that's about it. All right. Thanks, everyone.